can join anybody.
Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. All right, so I'm just doing a brief intro. Yep. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to Temple Beit Hayam. Welcome to our respective communities. My name is Rabbi Matt Durbin. I am the rabbi here at Temple Beit Hayam and it is It is quite amazing to see so many. <laughs> to see so many of us here today who are engaged, who have come to support us as an interfaith community. We will talk the elephant in the room but after, of course, well, for us as Jews, we have to eat. <laughs> we, will, we will discuss in some way our prayers and our thoughts for our beloved Israel. And for all those caught in a conflict that is painful. It is painful. It is difficult especially for if anyone has spent more than 10 seconds in the land of Israel. To see so many of you here today on a topic that affects all Western religion, Jews, Muslims, Christians, we all break bread. We all come together because food unites us. And food is very different from culture to culture, place to place, people to people. But seeing so many in this room who have come here, and I, and I, and I don't want to minimize it. I really want to say from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of our congregation and the Jewish people, that you've taken time out of your busy and hectic lives on a Wednesday, hopefully for the next five weeks, three of which will be here, to join us in conversation, to learn perhaps about terminologies, to learn about the rules of breaking bread. But I know you didn't come here to hear me. Hopefully you came for shake, 
Reverend Anderson, for Reverend Gore. I'd like to think a little bit for myself. <laughs> but really, we come here for community. Community comes from the root, common, that we share commonality. And in the essence of those words of breaking bread, for those that are familiar, please join in. I think it sounds a lot better in Hebrew than it does in English. But please join in with me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz Blessed are you, Lord our God, Sovereign of the Universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Okay, so this is part of our challenge. <laughs> There's a lot of us here. So, priest, how do we want to do this? <laughs> Nothing gives me greater joy than the look on his face. <laughs> and that's why we're friends. That wing, and then all the bleachers over there. The people got tickets on StubHub. So, uh, uh oh, Eleanor's got a question. Ah. You think so? So we got we got food on both sides, and then can they go on both sides of the table? Inside, left side. Just left side, right side. And this is a great time to recognize uh, John and his bandits of food people. Yeah. Okay. I think also the intent too is um, uh, when, when people go and get your food, uh, please, we're gonna be trying to having a, almost like a working lunch so that uh, please eat because we are well aware of time and there's a lot to discuss, so we just uh, we want to be uh, respective of time. So we will, Darcy, as you know, is our referee, I mean our moderator. Um, we, uh, so once the bell rings, we are really in her hands, because uh, she's really created the contact, uh, context. Uh, without her, you would just have a bunch of clergymen just talking for way too long, um, and she makes it digestible. So God bless you. We, we appreciate you being here. Um, and so, so really, so once it's gonna be different than before. We will eat and listen and engage. Uh, I know, in the, as we said, that there would be discussions at each table, but because of current events, we want to save that time for the actual content. Uh, and because we also want to talk about the elephant in the room, as Rabbi Durbin said. So, in, in this, let's let's get to it. Uh, and so, let's start with uh, one, two, three. Y'all, come on up and uh, grab some chow. Uh, and you want to do both sides, okay? And these last three over here, come on up. And then, can we get the AC down? No, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentlemen. You're welcome to sit right there. Next to you. Sure. Right. Thank you. Looks like there's It's got quite a lot of Christian is sitting here. Yeah. And I I'm not sure I'm not sure. I need to come back because I'll have you in the back. Okay. 
I'd like to test, 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 testing. It's not very loud. I, well, we've got these too. I don't know what Maybe they're. You need to hold it in your hand. Yeah. Check it and see. Those are uh, some terms, and I'm. They're just technical terms. You don't need to trouble with it right now. I thought people might want them later. Oh yeah. <clears throat> I think this is on. I thought, I think that was a, I thought that was a cigar. How does one? How does it turn up? Huh? How can I turn this up? Uh, I would just stay where you're at. You'll be fine. And let's hit, hit the board here. You can't turn it up. Yeah, when they quiet down. You, it's so hard to gauge right now with all this audience. I think once it gets quiet, you'll be good. Yeah, maybe this out. might have more volume. No, it'll be the same. I think it'll be good. So why don't you keep it off now? No, this is no. a separate mic. Justin. One, two. So just out of, out of the interest of time, and I know people are gathering food, but I want to take this moment this morning, this afternoon, again to thank you. The situation in the Middle East is not okay. I will say from a personal level, I can't even express to you how many phone calls and emails of friends and colleagues around the world. One of my colleagues called me from Europe yesterday and said, are you okay? And I said, no, I am not okay. The Jewish people are not okay. The state of Israel is not okay. The situation in Israel there's a very famous phrase in Hebrew, and I'm sure our Shin Shin Ashley can probably correct me as a native Hebrew speaker. Kol Yisrael Avarim Zelizeh. All Israel is responsible for one another, which means that as a community, we care for all in our region. I share with you today a prayer 
a prayer for Israel in times of war. Oh God, our strength and our protection, we fervently pray for the state of Israel in this devastating time of war, of shock, and of disbelief. Our hearts are breaking, oh God. We pray for the lives of the innocent civilians who have been heartlessly kidnapped by Hamas. Please, God, bring them home. Watch over them. Pray for the lives of the soldiers who have been taken captive. We pray for their safe return. Shelter them, O oh God. We pray for the souls of the innocent victims who were brutally slaughtered. Send comfort and strength to the grieving. Send healing to the injured and strength and wisdom to doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals. We pray for all of our brothers and sisters in Israel in this time of tragedy and crisis. Watch over Israel, God. Spread your shelter of peace over the land and over all our brothers and sisters who live there. Shine your light upon Israel's leaders, officers, and advisors. Help them to overcome all divisiveness and to act with clarity and determination. Protect the young men and women of Israel who defend us. Let them be safe and may they be victorious over Hamas terrorists who have attacked our people. Watch over them, God, and hear their prayers. Bring peace. Let it rain down from the heavens like a mighty storm. Let it wash away all hatred and bloodshed. Please, O oh God, God of the brokenhearted, God of the living, God of the dead, gather the souls of the victims into your eternal shelter. Let them find peace in your presence, O oh God, though their lives have ended, but their lights can never be extinguished. May they shine on as always and illuminate our way. We pray for all those caught in this terrible, terrible war. We pray for those innocent. El na Rafan Allah, God, please heal them. Heal the state of Israel. Give comfort to the families of the kidnapped and the captive. As we say together, Amen. Amen. It is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce to you our Israeli emissary, part of our Shin Shin program, Ashley, to say a few words. Shalom, everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Ashley Shlomovitz. I came from Israel two months ago, and I'll stay here the whole year. I really want to say thank you first all of you for coming. I can't even tell you how it warms my heart to see such a lovely community that stands together for Israel in the times that we really need you. And I invite you all to keep hoping for my family and my friends and my people in Israel that are now in hard times. And yeah, keep hoping, because I'm Israel Chai. And we are together a big community that should spread the love. And I hope I would have seen you in different times and not that times, but still. So thank you so much. Uh, before I turn the mic over to our moderator, Darcy, uh, you, uh, on the tables, on each table, you will see um, a flyer. If you have the time and the ability, this Friday, we are having a Shabbat service in solidarity with the State of Israel. So if you'd like to join us, I do encourage, if you have the time and the ability, please show up, please join us as a Jewish community and a wider community as we show our support through song, through music, through poetry, and through our service that is this Friday at 7 p.m. Darcy? How, is that? Okay. First of all, I want to, is that on? Yeah. 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 Keep yeah, pushing both, up. Both, both on. 
Okay. First of all, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to two new friends who are joining us for our Interfaith Breaking Bread series. Pastor Jerry Gore on my right from the Pentecostal Church of God in Christ in Stewart. And Sheikh Mohammed Shafayat of Al Hikmat Dawa Center in Pembroke Pines, reaching out in interfaith ways to the Muslim community and all other faiths. Yeah. And of course, you know Rabbi Matthew Durbin of Temple Beit Hayam and Father Christian Anderson from St. Mary's Episcopal Church. As many of you know, St. Mary's and Temple Beit Hayam have been engaged in interfaith and interracial work for some time now. We've had the Lunch and Learn series twice a year for at least three years, and that series was preceded by the radio show The Priest and the Rabbi, which was followed by a podcast. St. Mary's and the black community of East Stewart have participated in joint prayer walks, alpha courses, and the Sacred Ground series discussing the history of race and racism in this country. Both Rabbi Matthew and Father Christian have been asking themselves this question, what is God up to? Where is he leading us as we keep feeling this call to interfaith work? Well, it seems that God was leading us right up to this present moment. Amen. Amen. Because if there is one lesson we can learn from the horrific events that have been taking place in Israel these last few days, it's that the need for mutual understanding, mutual support, and interfaith communication, just like what we're doing here at Lunch and Learn, is more urgent now than ever. Israel and the Jewish people must know that they are not alone as they fight for their very existence. All our Jewish friends must know that we condemn in the strongest terms the act of barbarism and hate, the acts that have been perpetrated against them by a group of terrorists. There's a verse in chapter four of the book of Ecclesiastes that seems particularly apropos. It goes like this, roughly. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand together and conquer side by side. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So we all stand in solidarity with Temple Beit Hayam, and our prayer is that the three great Abrahamic religions will work together as a three-braided cord for genuine peace, mutual understanding, and mutual respect. And speaking of that three-braided cord, I'd like to give the Sheikh the chance to express his own support and feelings at this time. First of all, I thank God Almighty for blessing me and blessing us all to be here, Amen. to break bread together, to come together, and um, Special thanks to our rabbi for having us here at this temple. I really feel blessed and I feel very, um, I feel that we're all very chosen to be here and God always has a plan. But I want to join with the rabbi and everyone else in praying for peace in the Middle East. All this horrific uh, murder and all these sort of attacks that has taken place. Um, you know, we hear the most we can do is talk, but better than that is to pray. Because I always like to share with people that whatever is happening in Israel and Palestine, it's not a religious thing. I do not think it's a Jewish Muslim thing. That's my personal opinion. Because Jews and Muslims are supposed to be very close. We're not supposed to have anything to fight over because we are so close 
and have so many things in common. The same Abrahamic faith, the same God we worship, but unfortunately due to political reasons, and it's always about politics, power, uh, we have to witness these sort of unfortunate things that are happening. And I, of course, do not, and I've always heard that, you know, I'm not from Palestine, I'm from the Caribbean, and I always tell people when you want to have a good time, you go on a Caribbean cruise. So I always have a very good, jolly sort of mentality, and it really saddens me. It saddens me to see what's happening. But, um, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of people take things in their own hands, and I wish that politicians can be a little more level-headed in doing things so we can have more peace in the world. And um, I, of course, pray for all the, the, the victims and all those who have lost their lives and their families. And, you know, I, I never support terrorist movements. I, I have always spoken out of that. Uh, a lot of people agree and disagree with me on that. But I, I think even if there is a matter and there is an issue to handle, we need to handle it the right way, not the wrong way. And that's the mistake that human beings make. If we would only go according to the scriptures and the way God says to do things, we may be a more peaceful and better loving people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you, Sheikh. Well, well said. And Pastor Gore, I wonder, would you like to speak to this? Would you like to express your own solidarity? Good morning. Is it still a good morning? Good afternoon. Good evening. But anyway, I'm, my name is Jerry Gore, Pentecost, pastor of Pentecostal Church of God in Christ. I'm from South Carolina, right on the state line of North Carolina. So, I mean, I can cross over anytime I want. If I got in trouble with my mom in North Carolina, I just ran over to South Carolina where my daddy was. And they had different rules over there. But um, it seems to be a race wanting to attack another race. And we all believe in the same God. And it seemed that we cannot reach across the table and make any kind of agreement anymore or to share the, the, the revenues and the, the, the minerals and the things that we get out of our countries uh, to trade and to have peace in the world. And we come and, you know, we worked a long time, many, many, many years for us to be accumulated to the point where you got plenty of family members, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncle, and cousins. But somebody will wake up at night and feel like it's time to shake up another culture. And I don't think it's right at all. You know, uh, a lot of time when I see when our nationality be, we have uh, marches and things of that. And I'm saying, why is it so hard for what? To want, to want to have liberty and to want justice and to want peace. Why is that so hard when we all breathe the same air? We may eat different diets, but we all doing the same thing. And if you look right down on it, we are all the same. I, I really, when I, when I cut on the TV and see what was going on with the Jews in the Palestine, I said, that doesn't make any sense. Why destroy something somebody took a lifetime to make? Why destroy it? What's the purpose of it? And if you ever think down to it, in 2016, I had a liver transplant. And the donor wrote me a letter, prayed for me, had jokes the whole nine yards. But the donor was white. And it's been over seven years. Don't that make us compatible? Can't we get along? I think we can be compatible. I think we can too. Let's break bread together. There you go. So I don't know why we have to go through all of these things unnecessary to get along. And if we did what God say do, love ye one another as I have loved you, we could get rid of the other commandments because that's number one. That's number one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Gore. So, turning to our immediate subject, many months ago, Rabbi Matthew and Father Christian began to explore the idea of breaking bread, doing it as a series. 
They met with community leaders, Commissioner Eula Clark, who's here today, and Pastor Gore. <laughs> yes. Everybody wants to clap for Eula. Uh, to, to discuss the significance of food, faith, and how to build relationships across the table and across cultural divides. As Rabbi was saying, nothing brings people together more quickly and breaks down barriers more easily than a meal around a table. In fact, when the Sheikh was last at St. Mary's for an interfaith discussion, just before COVID started, he concluded the discussion by suggesting that we all get together someday for a feast that would feature all the foods of our different cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Well, we're not exactly doing that today, but we are going to explore what each of our faiths has to say about breaking bread, about food, about festivals that revolve around food and fasting, and about the importance our scriptures place on opening up our tables to those who are different from ourselves. When most of us use the phrase breaking bread, we naturally think of eating food with other people, not dining alone. Studies have shown again and again that there are great physical, psychological, and social benefits to sharing food around a table instead of eating in isolation. But sadly, due to changes in the family, the workplace, the food industry, and our American emphasis on individualism, nowadays almost 50% of Americans' meals are eaten alone. This contributes to the increasing sense of isolation that many Americans experience today. The Surgeon General himself has warned us about an epidemic of loneliness that is sweeping our country. To make up for this sense of isolation, and because we are, after all, social beings, our needs for connection are increasingly met through social media. So many of our contacts have become virtual. Our conversations narrow down to a group of people who think like we do, which militates against having any experience of the other, people who are different from ourselves and from whom we might actually learn something new. So thinking and talking about these issues this series on Breaking Bread was born. We'll not only be talking about how our different faith traditions treat the subject of food and feasting, but we'll actually, as you see, be doing it with people of different faiths and different backgrounds. In addition to the usual format of a shared dialogue between Christian and Jew, priest and rabbi, you'll learn about the Islamic take on food and feasting from the sheikh and they will be sharing from members of the black church community as well, who have their own unique take on fellowship around the table. Each week, we'll treat a slightly different aspect of breaking bread. For example, this week, we're concentrating on what the scriptures of each faith group have to say about regulations and restrictions having to do with food. What is kosher, halal, terafah, and haram? if I'm pronouncing all those words correctly. You will correct me in a moment. <laughs> Next week, we will focus very specifically on the particular festivals and meals that are central to each faith. The weekly Shabbat, Passover, Sukkot, Ramadan, the sacred Eids, that's spelled E-I-D-S, meaning festivals of the Islamic faith, the meaning of the Christian Holy Communion table, in week three, we'll talk about how contemporary culture has affected our faith traditions for better or worse. In week four, we'll hear from the panelists about their own personal, individual take on food, how they celebrate their high holy days, how they break bread in their own families and in community. And in week five, we'll ask, where do we go from here? How can we create opportunities to break bread together. It had been our intention, as was mentioned, to have group discussion around the tables uh, instead of our usual question and answer period. 
but because we wanted to take extra time to address the events of the last five days, we decided to put off group discussions around the tables for the time being. We have all been feeling very strong waves of emotions. Shock, anger, fear, outrage, grief. And when emotions are running this high, it seems a good idea just to catch our collective breath, take some time for reflection, and see how things develop in coming weeks. And we might return to group discussion around the table. What I'd like you to do now, this is just impromptu, everybody, if you're not chewing too much right now, just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath in, and then let it out slowly. Let some of that anxiety out. And just turn to your neighbor and say shalom, or the peace of God. That's how it all begins. So we're going to concentrate on these rules governing food. But since the New Testament mentions no food restrictions, most of the discussion will be with the rabbi and the sheikh. Perhaps, Father Christian, you can just briefly explain why Christians generally do not place restrictions on food, although some traditions have developed over the centuries during Lent and Passion Week and during other times of the year, but I'll let you address that. Darcy, it was all about a dream. It was all about a dream. Uh, so our, our brother Peter, St. Peter, had a dream or a vision. And on that vision, uh, so, so when, when Christianity was, the Jesus movement was starting, Paul and Peter were the two folks who led it. And I think this came up last time we all talked. They're saying, if you all worship a Jew, follow a Jew, why did you leave Judaism behind, your practice of Judaism as Christians? Which was a very good question. Um, and part of that comes down to uh, the embracing of the Gentile world. Uh, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, was the one who did that. And that, with going too deep into that, um, there was, so part of that evolution or movement of the Jesus movement, and we, we saw this leaving behind of some of these food laws. And so Peter was the man who was like, no, we are Jews, we are Jews for Jesus, we're following the rules, following the laws. And then he had a dream, he had a vision, and that vision was a, like a sheet coming down with all this different uh, clean and un, un, no, unclean food, yeah, unclean food on it. And in that, he said, I, well, God, I can't eat this. I can't eat this. This is not right. It's unclean. And the guy said, no, no, you're going to eat that. No, they, I, I, nothing I create is unclean, so, so go eat it. Um, and so Peter's interpretation from that was that now God has called us that it's, it's, that it's okay because God had made the food to eat the food. However, that didn't just end it with the, with the, the Jesus movement. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, uh, Jesus says uh, it's not what goes in that defiles you. Um, it, it, it's what comes out. Uh, and I don't think he meant biologically. So, so, so what, he, what he's getting at is that, um, that but that's, that, that's what Mark is saying. Uh, Mark later says, and because of this, unclean food can now be eaten. Uh, but I think there's a bigger theological reflection on this, which was also, this is where the Jesus movement again started to embrace Gentiles. Before that was only Jews, really for Jews. Jesus came and preached to the Jews. And after this, many theologians would say, no, actually, this vision that Peter had was to tear down the barriers between all the nations and saying there's no laws that now define us and separate us, so now let's open it up uh, for, for all to be invited. Um, but, but because of that, though, um, we don't have the, we don't, the laws were gone. But Paul also said, if, if, you're, if I'm having dinner with, with, uh, with Darcy and she follows the law, as a follower of Jesus, and I am a Gentile, and I follow Jesus, but I know that if I eat uh, unclean food in front of her, it's going to set her off. He says, don't eat the food. But why would you do that? Why would you do that to Darcy? Christian, just don't eat the food. Don't eat the meat. Just, she is more important. Win the person, not the argument. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Well put. Well put. Rabbi Matthew. Can you tell us a bit about the terms kosher, kashrut, and terafah? What foods are deemed forbidden, 
or terafa in the Hebrew scriptures? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I chuckle a little bit only because the laws of Kashrut, I mean, you could fill a library <laughs> on the rules you don't have to do and that the laws, today. but I will not do that today. Let, let me just go through um, uh, a few of the terminologies, Darcy, as you said. Um, kosher itself, kosher describes any food that complies with a strict set of dietary rules and laws. The rules themselves are called kashrut. The term kosher, kosher in Hebrew, means fitting, right? To have an animal that is fit, that is uh, in some way, uh, it is a clean animal. Trefa, tref, is any food that is not kosher, usually used in terms of pork and shellfish, right? The rules, just to go through them very, very, very briefly, is as Jews, we are allowed to eat, again, this is more of a traditional uh, perspective, any animal that chews its cud with split hooves from fish, those that have fins and scales. Therefore, shrimp, lobster, clams, mussels, right? You get the idea. It is deemed not kosher. Vegetables are deemed kosher because they come from the earth. However, there are gray zones with even with vegetables because of insects and others that happen to go on to certain foods that would render them not kosher. But generally, the, the understanding is that uh, again, kosher refers to the set of dietary laws, and the, the rules themselves are called kashrut. And uh, is it necessary that the rabbi bless certain things uh, in order to kind of give them an official stamp of kosher? So, so uh, many, and we, we call it a hexer. Um, so many, many of you may be familiar if you go buy certain products, right? There is certain uh, emblems that are put on it. Sometimes it says OU, the Orthodox Union. Uh, there are many other different, different uh, markings themselves. Generally, they are blessed. Um, but again, I, I just want to make, make clear that most of the basic laws of kashrut are derived from the Torah in the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy. Their details and practical implications, however, are set down in what we call the oral law, known as what we call the Mishnah. Uh, and it's codified also in the Talmud, um, and, and subsequently uh, later in rabbinic literature. But uh, in that regard, yeah, things are blessed. Usually, uh, well, I shouldn't say usually, food is rendered kosher by um, salting. Right? Salt removes the moisture, the blood, out of an animal, for we are not to eat any blood. Okay? Um, that would render it in some way. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that you were to have a utensil or a plate or something that was not kosher. Well, how do you kosher it? It's very easy. There are two ways to do it. One is you um, use intensive heat. Intensive heat will kosher a utensil. The other, as my grandmother used to do, was to take a fork or whatever utensil, usually around just before Passover when she would kosher her entire house, and she would stick it in a potted plant. Now we laugh at that in some way, but the potted plant, it's the earth. The earth is a koshering element. What goes into the earth will render something kosher. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you. I never knew that. Just don't eat it once it's... <laughs> <laughs> and no worms. No worms. No worms. Or snakes. Or snakes or eels. Uh, Sheikh, the Quran also has laws regarding foods. Certain foods are halal or permitted, and others are considered haram, forbidden. So what foods are those? that are forbidden, and is there a large overlap with the Jewish uh, rules and, and laws? 
Well, that's an interesting question coming after the rabbi. I'll tell you why. And I love to answer the question after the rabbi. Maybe we should keep that same format. <laughs> why? Because it helps me. Everything that is basically um, forbidden according to Jewish faith to eat, it's the same in the Islamic faith. Interesting. And uh, so that whatever the rabbi said, I'm in accordance with that. That's very interesting. That's why in the Quran, and I'm not just saying this to make you and myself happy because I'm here in the temple, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to make the rabbi happy. But if you go in the Quran in chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 5, God Almighty says, and you can eat of the people or eat from the people of the book, mm -hmm. Kitab. And the Jews are considered the Ehli Kitab. And the Christians are also considered Ehli Kitab. But because we are here in food discussion, I mean, it's a learning situation. And we got to agree to disagree, right? <laughs> so the Quran speaks about Ehli Kitab, meaning the Christians and Jews, that we are allowed to eat their food. And the rabbi has just explained what is not allowed, snakes and, uh, and all these sort of wild birds of prey and the shark and all these things. We also not allowed to eat that. And I don't know if maybe we go down in the Orthodox Christianity, if we may find that. I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I know, and I, I cannot speak on behalf of Father Christian, but I know that Christianity has more flexibility. So therefore, maybe a lot of the Jewish laws that... Um, were, were lived and practiced by Jesus, Christians are more flexible with it. So one day, I was in a, in a meeting. Very interesting, very interesting, Darcy. And my friend, <laughs> I had uh, two Christian friends with me. So we said, um, we got to order lunch. So they were like, um, okay, we're going to order pizza with what? Bacon, huh? Is it bacon? What do you call it? Pepperoni? Pepperoni, Pepperoni. Pepperoni from bacon, yeah. So then one of them said, no, 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 the sheikh does not eat that. So we'll have to order something else. So I just jokingly said, I said, but as Christian, Jesus, ne Jesus never ate pepperoni. <laughs> Jesus never ate pork. And they were like, truly? I said, yes, you go check it out. That's one of the things of Jesus. Jesus never ate pork. So coming back to the origin, so it's nothing to do about Jesus. It's about people's flexibility. But, um, you know, I, I, I want to share this. Interesting on the point of um, breaking bread together. Do you know that there is a great commonality between Christians, Jews, and Muslims when it comes to fish? Jews love fishing. Moses grew up in the water. <laughs> Moses went down the river Nile. He opened the whole sea. Are you telling me Moses never ate fish? Jews were very good at fishing. They were known to be good fishermen, and they fished a lot. Isn't that so? So were Jews only fishing not to eat? No. <laughs> what did Jesus feed the people? The five pieces of bread and two fish? The thousands of people. And in Islam, we are told that one of the first food that you will get in paradise will be fish. So maybe in that one of our next program, we'll have to make bread and fish <laughs> as the menu. <laughs> Jesus, a Muslim, Jews, and Christian, the same menu. But why I'm saying that, because we're all around food, so I want to share how much commonalities we got yeah. in the origin. It's later on, you know, we the people later on, we sort of interpreted differently and we changed the laws. There's something you mentioned, Darcy, and I, am I pronouncing it correct? Yes, Darcy, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that 50% of people in America are lonely or they eat alone. Yeah. yeah, they eat alone. Do you know in Islam there is a saying in the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that some people went to him and they said that we eat but we do not feel satisfied. They said we eat but we do not feel satisfied. We don't benefit, we don't, en we don't feel after eating the food, we don't feel satisfied. So he asked them, he said, do you eat alone? Mm. They said, yes. He said, that's the problem. Right. Do you so know well that's put. a very, that's a saying of the prophet. So when you said that, I'm like, wow. He said, eating together brings baraka from God. And baraka, baraka, and in your prayer you had a word like baruch. What does baruch mean? Bless. So in Islam, baraka means blessing. And when we begin to eat, we say, Bismillah wa barakatullah. 
we begin in the name of God and the blessings from God. So, Baraka is blessing. So, it is interesting that he said that when you eat together, and I wanted to share this because, I mean, we got about 175, 80, 80 to 200 people sitting here. You know what a blessing it is to come together and eat? Amen. If people can just come together to eat, that's a great success in humanity. Amen. That's Amen. <laughs> Uh, and this is all very religious, very much with the three faiths. And if we get into the human being world and the love world, we know the famous saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Yep. And that's why, <laughs> that's why a lot of women feed men nice meals, you know. The men pay for the meal at the restaurant, but she selects what he eats. <laughs> when you go to the restaurant, doesn't the husband say, honey, what should we order? <laughs> but he pays the bill, right? But at the end of the day, she chooses the meal for him to eat, and he's so happy with it. So even to win the heart of a man, it goes through his stomach, eating. Nice to be here. Wonderful. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do know there is one dietary restriction that our head chef, John Norris, has had to cope with as he's trying to create halal and kosher food. Uh, he loves to make sauces with alcohol, pouring wine into things, and that is a no-no. Drinking alcohol is a no-no for Muslims, and so I have to hand it to John and his team. They have kept everybody safe. <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, first of all, Rabbi, is there an explanation, because many people have asked me this, as to why certain foods are forbidden in scripture? Is it medical or hygienic reasons, or is it more to preserve a distinction, a kind of separation that shows you are Jewish or you are Muslim? Is it that? So, here. You don't need a mic. <laughs> I do not. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I think given the question itself, it goes with that adage, ask, ask five Jews and you're going to get a thousand different responses. Um, for me, and I do believe that part of the, the, the rules and the need for kashrut is about separation, right? It's about separating what we're eating. It's also about being mindful, being mindful of what we're eating, right? We do not mix milk and meat, okay? So, I mean, if you were to ask most Jews and say, in your mind, if you were to have a nice steak with a frothy glass of milk, most of us, if not all of us as Jews, our stomach turns, we get sick to our stomach. It's visceral. I mean, we feel it. No way. Ew, gross. But that's just the way we've been born and raised, right? I should also mention as well with the laws of kashrut and of kosher uh, animals, there's also, it, 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 it is of the utmost um, honor and respect of how the animal is prepared, okay? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that um, in a bit. Uh, but but that, that in and of itself um, really is it. For, for me, I think for most Jews, it is about the separation. We're separating, right? It is about identity. It's what we believe. We're told by God that there are certain animals and certain foods that are permitted, and then there are other animals that are not permitted, that you shall not eat. Um, you shall not eat, for example, any animal that has died natural causes. You shall not eat any animal with imperfections or blemishes. You shall not eat, uh, and forgive the expression, um, you know, an animal that's been killed by the side of the road. You do not eat uh, of any blood. You know, th there are so many, many, many rules, but in, in some way, I, I do believe it is about um, the separation and certainly about being mindful of what we're consuming. But some, some of it's just smart. I mean, pigs are disgusting. They eat their own poop. So it's, you know, is there Thank you for bringing that up, Christian. I mean, uh, very uh, important point. God would say, don't eat pork. I mean, right? <laughs> trichinosis. There also trichinosis. trichinosis. There is trichinosis. Pretty practical. Very practical at a time when the meat could not be purified in the same way it is now. Yeah. But I was just amazed in researching this I mean, I thought, Rabbi can't eat a Reuben sandwich. <laughs> I mean, 
that just struck me as very strange because it has cheese and meat together. And I don't know why, I just had this sort of uh, stereotype in my mind that it was a classic Jewish sandwich, and that's totally bogus. I have never had a cheeseburger in my life. <laughs> or a pepperoni pizza with mozzarella and... <laughs> oh, oh, oh no, oh no, your secret is safe with us. I went to high school once. <laughs> Turn the cameras off. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask the Sheikh, uh, do you kind of feel that the rules are basically for that same reason too, to keep a kind of distinction, a certain separation, and a, a thoughtfulness, a mindfulness about what you're eating? So basically, um, again, I followed the rabbi, and it's just as he said, but there's a little technicality here. In Islam, we, interesting you said that you cannot eat dairy products and drink milk. And in Islam, wi with meat, sorry, you cannot drink, m eat meat and drink milk, mix them. So in Islam, we were told by the prophet, peace be upon him, that you should not drink milk and eat fish interesting together and again it is something to do with digestion so uh, coming to your question um, I mean the first question I, I know I didn't get in details with it because the rabbi had already answered the details so I didn't want to repeat the same food so that was one thing so there's a similarity with milk and that but milk is considered a very 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 high blessed spiritual food from the Quranic Islamic point of view because God speaks very highly about how unique milk is, and it's considered one of the blessings of God, how he has caused milk to be produced from the cow, and it comes out so pure, and there is a volumes written on that. Um, we were also taught that one of the reasons why the food, the food is, um, has been specified as Jewish food, and the reason why the very same kosher laws we have, the same kosher laws, that's why when we travel, and there are not halal food, we order kosher. Hmm. Oh yeah, when we travel, and you know, in trains or planes or wherever, and you have the option to order food, then as a Muslim, we'll put kosher, because it's the same diet. Um, we were taught that God says that he created us human beings, and he knows what is best for us. So the reason why, it's not only for separation that, um, that the food was, 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 certain foods are restricted and certain foods are permissible, but it was really for hygienic purposes. It was done for special hyg benefits for the human body. So, Father, you're right. That's what the reason why in Islam, pork is not permissible. The pig is not permissible for Muslims to eat. Now, we are allowed to use the parts of the pig for other things. So the Quran only says, meaning the meat the, of the pig or the, the swine is not permissible to eat, and it's all for physical, biological health reasons, hygiene, hygienic reasons. So all the, all the other reasons for other animals, I mean, we can go into it, but you know, you look at the shark, you know, when you want to speak of someone bad in town, you say that's the shark in the town, he eats up everybody else. And there's a little philosophy about food. Now, don't hold me to it. All you all are very well detailed university graduates. So don't hold me to the specific. This is just research. You know, when you do research, it doesn't mean that you will make laws pertaining to that. But there is a little research that has been done. And it says people are affected by what they eat. People, a lot of people, generally, people are affected by what, what you eat. So if you eat lions and tigers and wild animals, you may just act like lions and animals. <laughs> so <laughs> I always like to make the joke, Rabbi. I mean, listen, this is a very jovial evening, so we could learn with a lot of fun. So when I talked to our congregation, Father, I said God created natural milk in the breast of a mother. Doctors and scientists have proven today that milk, the breast milk is so healthy it's the healthiest food for the child god has a reason why it helps the body the organs the teeth everything in the human body so when the baby drinks the milk of a mother the baby grows up like a mother's child but when you give a baby an animal milk to drink what do you expect the baby to grow up like an animal thank you very much <laughs>
I don't miss my point, but you gotta go what I'm saying. God gave us a mother, you drink the right milk, you may have that love and affection and compassion of that comfort from that mother, but sometimes, I mean, if there's health reasons, don't miss my point, there are laws and reasons, and the mother cannot do it, and there are no reasons, no problem. But don't just unnecessarily, you know, there's a reason. Your baby can drink healthy milk from the mother or something close to nobody. But don't just find all kind of unnecessary substitute because it's what we feed our children and how we, we, we bring them up, that's what they will be produced. And similarly, it is to do, that's why we are not allowed to eat shark, Rabbi, because shark is a vicious kind of uh, uh, fish out there. It just eats up everybody else. So what you eat will kind of affect you to have that into you. So it's hygienic reason and a little psychological, philosophical concept behind it. Darcy, can I ask uh, Rabbi a quick question? Please. So in the movie uh, Noah with um, <laughs> Russell Crowe, St. Russell, uh, the movie suggests that before the flood that we were all vegetarians, or at least That's Jews true. were vegetarians. That's absolutely true. Okay. Uh, and so then what changes again the why we decided let's just start Eat, eating some meat. Because I'll tell you the most, you, you bring up this thing about what we eat. Probably the most humble person in our office is a vegetarian. Um, so, so maybe, you know, maybe she's, uh, you know, not consuming all of the, the vitriol of the animals. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm just joking around here. But, but can we, can, do we have time to expound on that? Or should we just well, put a... Let's wait till, till, till... Bookmark um, that. Uh, um, series two. Uh, Next okay. Week. Next series week. two. Should we all be vegetarians? <laughs> We will have that answer next week. Remember that. I'd like to uh, propose a little thought experiment for Pastor Gore and for Reverend Christian. Uh, we know that Jesus was a good practicing Jew, and no doubt he observed all the Hebrew laws concerning food, but he also spent a lot of time in Galilee of the Gentiles amongst the Gentiles, where meat would have been sacrificed to a foreign god. The food certainly wasn't kosher. Now, there is no right or wrong answer to this, but what do you think, Father Christian, uh, that Jesus did in that situation, just using your imagination? I don't think we have to use too much of our imagination. I mean, Scripture is pretty clear that he was a good Jew. And there was times when he gets challenged at times. They're saying, why don't your uh, disciples wash their hands beforehand? Uh, and then he goes on that whole riff in Mark 6 and 7 about what is, uh, what really is unclean. It's, it's, it's what you, it's what comes out, not what goes in. But there's no suggestion in Scripture that would say that he, he would challenge sometimes, and he would say, what's the big picture? And you can argue, I think some Jewish theologians would say what Jesus was pushing back against, and Rabbi, you and I have talked about this, about some of the pharisaical rules, uh, as Jesus might have been a, a pharisaical rabbi, that he's questioning the tradition, but questioning the law of God, uh, that, that is, that's, that's a slippery slope, that, that he was more questioning some of these, because you said, Rabbi, you said the Kashrut could the, the, the library. So sometimes this is a lot of riffing going on of what's coming out of Deuteronomy. Um, so I would say, no, I would say Jesus was pretty good about, he, he was a good Jew, and then nothing else suggests that he wasn't. Absolutely. I just was thinking that there are these exceptional circumstances. Jesus even speaks of them. You know, when David had to run, he was on the lamb, so to speak, and he let his soldiers eat of the showbread, uh, which normally would have been forbidden, but um, urgency required it. Pastor Gore, what do you think Jesus would have done in that situation? Do you think he would have participated and eaten things that were kind of forbidden or not? Uh, yes, I think he would have, because uh, I think Mark 7 and 17, 18 through 19 says that, uh, that just like uh, Christian is saying, that whatever goes into the body does not defile the body, but what comes out of the body defiles, it comes from the heart, and that's what defiles the body, okay? That's why a lot of times we don't drink alcohol, because once you start drinking alcohol, whatever is really true is coming out. We can hide it as long as we ain't drinking. But once we're drinking it, then it come out. And he was letting us know that there was going to be a change. Because there's nobody, I don't think nobody in this room here could keep the law. 
And so now he was trying to get us on the track to grace. And I'll tell my church that all the time. Y'all think y'all can keep the law? Yes. Well, why are you rolling through all these stop signs in the community? That sign says stop. Why don't you stop? Why don't you go through the crosswalk where this exit made for you? We cannot keep the law. We cannot. But by grace and mercy, and so Jesus is changing all these things here now because there's too many, uh, uh, too many idle things that causes us to miss the mark. Mm. And so he's going to put us all on the same page. And I, I tell you, I always envy the Jews because I don't think nobody never died for me. And he did that. And that was, the Jews was his firstborn son. And if you got a firstborn son, we name him what? Junior. That's how close he was. And so he, he came here specifically. Now, we as Gentiles, you know who the Gentiles are? See, the Jews are sought aside for God's purpose. That's his first son. He loved them. Okay, and then us Gentiles, when Peter was on the housetop and he was lowering down this sheet, and he said, slay and eat. Peter said, never have I put anything defiled and nasty in my mouth. Never have I done this. He said, Peter, don't call anything that I made unclean and undefiled. And by that time, some two men were knocking on the door, and he said, get up and go with them. Peter never did get his food. So <laughs> he went up and went down to Paul. Well, guess what was down there? Just Gentiles. Cornelius. He went down to Cornelius. So Gentiles. And what draw, draw Jesus there, had him drawn there, uh, a, uh, a Gentile was giving good alms. A Gentile was helping people. A Gentile was loving people. And that's what he was trying to get us all to do, the same exact thing. So he said, no, they're just as good as we are. Okay, I'm taking your point. I think you have a fundamental disagreement with Father Christian, but that is okay. We're here to do exactly that. Uh, Rabbi, we were just, we almost touched on it. Uh, there are particular rules about uh, how to put an animal to death, how to slaughter it, and they're very particular. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of overlap with what is halal, the way, but maybe you can kind of describe if they're different and what they are anyway. So, so when we look, when we look at um, the ways in which an animal is prepared, uh, Judaism has always maintained treatment for the animal. The animal must not feel any pain. So the knife that is used by a shochet, one who uh, ritually slaughters, when it goes from ear to ear, it's instantaneous. The animal feels no pain. Uh, so we think. Right. But, but there, is, there, is, there is great respect for the treatment of animals, right? We are even told, you do not work your animal on Shabbat, for it is a day of rest, right? So I think that they're, I mean, that, they're, in a very general sense. Um, I should also say that, look, as Jews, um, we do use alcohol <laughs> a lot. From the right of Brit Milah, the right of circumcision, as Jews, we've got wine on our lips when we're eight days old. Wine is a symbol of joy. However, I will make this clear as well, although Judaism does use alcohol in terms of wine and spirits and what have you for the elevation and for uh, its connection and for its, its um, uh, symbol of life, uh, it is in moderation, not in excess with the exception of one holiday called Purim, okay, in which you were supposed to get blind drunk that you don't know the difference between Mordechai and Haman. Is that in scripture? You're supposed to get drunk? It, I'll bring you the reference next week. <laughs> but, there, but there is something, again, about, about, about wine, and I think also if we put it into context, okay, remember, water was not readily available. Drinkable water. Wine was, right? You grow grapes, you ferment them, right? Uh, it, there's a whole list of the laws of kashrut pertaining to grapes and how they're produced and how you make wine. 
Uh, we'll leave that for now. But, but that notion of wine is a symbol in Judaism, uh, a symbol of joy. Um, I should also preface as well, uh, just much like, like I think Sheikh, you had mentioned as well, is the way in which we prepare ourselves to eat, right? We wash our hands, right? We have customs and rituals and traditions that are done. If you go back uh, 800 some odd years ago and look at the Black Death or the bubonic plague, Jews were dying. We were not dying in mass numbers like the Europeans. We washed our hands. Our foods were different, right? We kept the laws of kashrut. So in some way, it is about the cleanliness, um, washing of the hands, or perhaps even from a body perspective, we have what we call the mikvah, or the mikvah, uh, uh, the, the ritual cleansing uh, of the body uh, that we would do. There are some uh, traditional Jews who might go to the mikvah just before Shabbat to prepare themselves. But I think everything in Judaism is a preparation for the act to which we are doing. Thank you. I, I understand that when Noah first got off of the ark and uh, was cultivating grapes, and the first thing he did was get drunk. But it wasn't even per him. By no, and it's interesting if you juxtapose Noah with Abraham, for example, right? Noah's first thing that he does is he plants, right? He plants grapes so he can provide for himself his own vineyard so that he gets drunk. And we won't go into what happens to Noah after. Um, That's best. That's yes, best. Yes, we just don't want that image to stay with us all day. But um, if you juxtapose that with Abraham, what Abraham does is he builds an orchard. Not for himself, but for everyone else. Noah is only concerned for his, his own self. Oh, which is why, at least I would, I would believe, that the text says that Noah was righteous in his generation. Uh, it doesn't say of all generations. Pastor Gore? What? Yeah. But I, I, I'm about to pass it over to Sheikh, so oh, okay. just briefly. Yeah, yeah briefly. Hi, uh, Smith, uh, Smith Hill, up in Fedville, North Carolina, they have a slaughterhouse. We call it slaughterhouse. And my brother was working there, and he thought he was on the farm. So to get the hogs into the slaughterhouse, he took him a stick to usher him in. He got fired because those hogs are supposed to be so laid back because once you uh, upset them, it tents the meat up. The meat not as good. And so there is a way. There is a way that you supposed to kill animals. Absolutely. You don't want that adrenaline and cortisol no, being released into the system, you know, the stress response. Sheikh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the same kinds of rules governing butchering or slaughter, if, if, if it's the same or slightly different. Uh, again, <laughs> very uh, wonderful uh, um, a question after the, the rabbi. We are again on the same slaughtering pr um, processing of the, the animals according to Judaism. That's why we're allowed to eat the kosher. Um, in fact, um, in some cases, a lot of Muslims sometimes even choose to eat uh, Jewish kosher meat than Muslims because they know that Jews are more, 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 more uh, what do you say, but much more stronger in authorizing and ensuring that the processing, the process of the meat, and I want to use it because it's processing plants to do all these, whether it's birds or, 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 or lamb or whatever it is. So in many cases, I know there is a rabbi that is there authorized to go and certify that everything was done properly. Now, Muslims, in some cases, we are a little more lenient. We take a certificate for it, but it's, you know, you send someone once in a month and they certify the plant or the processing plant, and we take that for okay, but I know the rabbis, in some cases, got to go and um, authorize the authenticity of the proper slaughtering process. So it's the same thing like Judaism. You gotta, and you know there is a, again there is a saying in Islam and the teaching teach you that when you do that slaughtering you must cause no pain to the animal, the least as possible. You gotta use the sharpest animal, um, weapon, the very same thing as, as, as kosher. So I mean, I, I don't want to elaborate on it to, to save time, right? But there's another thing, interesting, while Islam does not permit alcohol, we are not allowed to drink alcohol. 
The Quran tells us that in alcohol there is some faida, meaning benefit. <laughs> so it does not say alcohol is not good. Very interesting. The Quran, Islam does not tell us that alcohol is not good. What it tells us is drinking too much is not good. So what it did, it says, and because drinking too much, and again back to, the, you see the similarity, I'm looking at the connection, the commonality here. It just as Rabbi said, you cannot, you got to be moderate. So Islam says, but because there is the one to drink more and go beyond moderation, it became forbidden. But it says, don't worry, in paradise you can drink. No limit. <laughs> in paradise. So it, 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 Islam tells us, from good, but because of that same Jewish law here now, it, may, it came back now and said, well, restrict it because no one will want to limit. They will get beyond the limit and can control. So I had to share that on that point of view. Um, on the next process of the washing the hands, we also have a law that we are taught to wash hands before you eat. And again, the teaching of Islam is, and if you wash your hands before you eat and after you eat, Therein your food lies more baraka. Again, interesting. The, very interesting how baraka blessings is attached to washing your hands before. Because it has some godly spiritual thing. And I used to think it was just a Muslim thing. But now I'm hearing it's also a Jewish thing. And I used to also think that it's only because in those days they would eat with their hands and not knife and fork. So it also is hygienic that you need to wash your hands before you eat. You know, I, I, you know, there's a law that if you go and sh if before you eat in Islam and you wash your hands, you don't wipe it. That's another law. If you notice some doctors, before they do a surgery, they, they, they do that. They don't really take napkins and wipes because they don't want the particles from those napkins and cloth and towels to get on the utensils or whatever apparatus they're using. So in Islam, when you wash your hands, you're supposed to drain it off like that, but don't touch napkins. Because if you look at a cloth and a towel and put a sunlight on it or a light on it with a magnifying glass, what do you see? Bunch of particles just flying around. <laughs> so you hold that and you put that in your mouth after. Oh, yeah. Th that's, why, that's why some places that have the blower, do you know, in some Burger King and McDonald's, they have the blowers. And then they tell you for hygienic reason, use the blower, it's better because you're not touching anything. So we have that also in our diet, that when you wash your hands before you eat, don't wipe it, because if you touch anybody else's hands, or you touch anything else, and you put that in your mouth, then you're in a problem. But after you eat, then you wipe your hands after you wash it. So it's that. No, but, so, you know, that's, but it's not like haram. You know, you use the term somewhere, haram. It's not like you're going to go to hell if you don't wash your hands. It's all about virtues. You get more blessings. It's more baraka in it. It's not that if a person, the next thing you see someone, like I just ate here, I didn't wash my hands. You're going to say, what's going on here? <laughs> but even when you notice I ate, I held my bread with my napkin. Because if you didn't wash your hands, you should not touch food. So I held the, the bread, I took the napkin, you do this all eat, and I was holding the napkin and eating the, 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 the sandwich. So it's for hygienic reason, and it has blessings. And another point again on our diet, on the, the food, as Father Christian had asked, and you spoke about um, Jews and what they eat. Sometimes, I, in my research, I have seen that lamb has been a common factor between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, because Jesus was a shepherd. Moses also, uh, David, Moses, they all were shepherds, Jacob. So definitely lamb had been a food of their time. And if we want to go down to the, 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 the Jewish, because in Islam, and I'm going to the Islamic point, lamb is considered one of the healthiest meat. And if you check down in the Jewish tradition, we may have a difference between Ismail, or Ishmael you say, and we say Ishmael and Isaac, yeah. There may be a little, there's a, uh, a philosophical, theological difference about the son that, was that, that mo Abraham was commanded to sacrifice. So, you know, we, okay, but I just want to talk about the meat. So, they, when, when, G when Abraham was told that he had fulfilled the mission, then what did God give him? You guys got something called a shofar, right? A shofar? A shofar, you call it, the, the blow? Yep. So, it was a ram to celebrate. It was a sheep. 
So, so, so Abraham celebrated his success with the ram sheep. We celebrate the success of Abraham with a ram sheep. So we have that common of lamb, a sheep being a meat that we all have in common from Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're just about to wrap up. I do have a list of terms here because there, we've gotten into a little bit of technical vocabulary and I don't want you to feel like you had to keep that all in your head. So uh, I'll put some up here on the front here so you can pick that up if you would like to. Um, as you were talking about alcohol, I couldn't help but thinking about my, my friend Amina al-Sabah who was a naughty Muslim. <laughs> And whenever she would drink vodka, it was always turkey vodka. <laughs> turkey vodka. Bacon, turkey bacon. So uh, we've only got a few minutes. To, uh, would you like to pray us out, or how would you like to handle this? Well, I think to bring it back to people ask Rabbi Durbin and I, like, why, why, why are you guys so passionate about interfaith work? And I think today just speaks for itself. Um, when we have hit moments of chaos, and when the chaos will always be here, it's been here since Genesis, uh, since creation, um, it's, it's the community and the relationships that we form that get us through it. And we experienced this before when we, uh, after George Floyd, uh, the relationships with uh, the black churches that we were able to not just make a token phone call, but call our friends the black leaders, Rabbi and myself, because we've been building that. And it's important because it, it's, it's, it's important for our hearts because God has placed it in there. But then when we share it with our respective congregations, you all are m even hungrier for it, or you wouldn't even be here today. Uh, so I think it says a lot about our respective congregations. It says a lot about the spirit of God that is, that is alive in this place, uh, is alive in this community. Uh, it says a lot about the Abrahamic people Muslim, Jew, or Christian, uh, and for a time like this where it does seem like the world is falling apart, um, we have not retreated to our respective tribes. We have not retreated to our respective places. We have come to uh, our co Jewish community that, yes, is feeling very afraid, very isolated, very alone, especially in Martin County, which does not have a large Jewish population. And here on this stage, you have an imam and two Christian pastors embracing uh, our rabbi, our rabbi, and this Jewish community. So, so I want you to know that, uh, you know, Temple Bat Hayam, you, you, you are loved, and we love you. Uh, Rabbi, we love you. Uh, it's because you, you gave us the model for it, uh, to, to do that, because you do that for us. Uh, you're still my 2 a.m. phone call if uh, I need you to help me with no questions asked. I'm calling you. <laughs> um, but it, I, I want to say thank you because you, you are hungry for this. And if not, you wouldn't be here. You'd be like, I'm not dealing with that. I don't trust those people. But, but we trust each other and we love each other. Uh, and the food brought us here. <laughs> uh, and, and so that always makes things go well. So, so thank you all. Um, a, a big yay to God. Uh, and I, I'm just thankful to God to put that hunger in our spirit uh, because it is, I think we could agree on this. All of our sacred texts point us to the one place. If it's not about love, it's not about God. And, um, and, I, and I do sense the love of God in this room. Amen? Amen. Okay, good. So, um, all right. Well, uh, Rabbi, I, 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 I would defer to, to Rabbi to give a, uh, to, to close us in prayer. Um, and then, of course, we'll see how the, the, the following weeks come and, and um, the world will be what it is. And we continue on. And this will be our, this will be our bomb in Gilead, is, is, is this every Wednesday. Um, and then we'll, we take it day by day, and we lift up to Almighty God to bring us the peace that's beyond our understanding. Rabbi? Dear God, we thank you for all of us to come together to break bread. We thank you. We pour out our feelings, our thoughts for one another. Lo yisagoy o goy cherev, lo yimajud o milchama. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. 
nor shall they learn or train for war anymore. We pray for peace, shalom bayit, peace in our home, peace on our borders, peace in the Middle East. We pray for the captives to be released in safety and speedily. We pray for all people around the world. Adonai Ozle Moiten, Adonai Varechatemova Shalom. May God grant strength to our people. May God bless our people and all people with the gift of peace. Amen. Again, on behalf of our panel discussion, on behalf of our congregation, uh, I thank you for joining us. I hope you'll join us again next Wednesday, and I hope that you will join us Friday night at 7 o'clock here in our sanctuary for a solidarity Shabbat with the State of Israel. Thank you. easy keeping these guys under control.
I will let it get a little quieter, I guess. Thank you for your time. Yes, absolutely. I'd love to have your card in my room. Because when I called, uh, they reached out to me. Thank you, Shafia. Is it Shafia? Yeah, Shafia. Yeah, Shafia. Very good. Awesome. Well, look, when I, Jim from the church had reached out to me and said, hey, I, you know, just so you know, we're doing this. And I said, I said, I said, wow, at, 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 yeah, exactly. And what you know because we've seen all these things going on there, but see something positive that can bring well, the other thing. Well, I was surprised. I'm surprised. I mean, right? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. You know what I mean? Like that. Like it is that was the step. I mean, they didn't have enough And I think, fortunately, you have other clergymen who are very aren't clothed yeah. and kind of willing to, you know. It makes everyone feel comfortable because I'm certainly, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you went to other, perhaps, congregations, the welcome may not be as warm. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's kind of, it, it's kind of, and it allows you to be kind of clear. And, 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 you know, I mean, because look. Shake Shafia um, from, well, what's, uh, do you have a, a mosque or a certain yes. place or what? Yeah, Darul Ulum Islamic Institute. Okay, spell, uh, is it where is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Darul Ulum Islamic Institute in Hollywood. What do you feel, well, let's talk about this event specifically. Was this an encouraging event for you? I think it was, it was very encouraging. So you thought coming here, perhaps it wouldn't be, you know, as 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 much brotherhood and sisterhood here, and that you could speak freely. And uh, you, what was your message to the audience? Well, as, as I said in my message to them, you know, it is important that we understand this is How simple, when you talk about commonalities, that you could all break bread here. When you talk about fashion, I eat a lot of food every day. You know, the food, that certain 
rituals were very similar between Hindu and Jews. I thought that was very interesting when you said, if I can't have a halal meal, I want a kosher. I never would have thought that. Yeah, because it's, it's not only kosher, it's the same. It's the same. That's why we allow to eat the kosher of the Jews, because they have the same diet and laws as we have. So, you know, as I said, biologically, spiritually, in all ways, What is the, the, mis the, the misconception that you as, as a Muslim face, not just here, but, but anywhere? You know, some people might just, again, unfortunately, look at you and think, oh, he must say. Yeah. The things that you say, look, we, we all have common bonds as we can say. So, you know, um, I try to look at things uh, from a scripture point of view, not from an emotional point of view, because... about making the situation worse. How, how can we do that? I mean, it just feels we've had generations of tit for tat or, or, or whatever. Again, I'm not a scholar of the region. From your perspective, what, I mean, how can we get to a two-step solution? Is there something that you see, that you study, that you say, maybe if our politicians can get this way, we might have seen it off? Well, I have put this in from a, a religious point of view. That, I mean, religion, we have no say over the politicians. But I think, because it's Palestine and Israel, we should be talking about people and talking about politics. But then it involves in yeah, I appreciate religious it. people, Jewish people, Muslims. So I, I, I always like to suggest that politicians have a discussion with religious leaders from the Muslim point of view and the Jewish point of view, but very liberal, moderate, balanced religious leaders that will not add more fuel to fire. And that may help bring a balanced situation because, let's be real, there are Muslims who live in Israel. There are Christians who live in Palestine. There are Jews who are in the Palestinian territory. So we have people who will live together. And in Jerusalem, we have all three. So you need a religious leader to balance the situation from the power political and that may help me. <laughs> How far a drop? What, what did it, how long did it take uh, you to get up? It took an hour and a half, yeah. isn't it? I, I, have, I have another program. I have an interfaith program. It's sticky this year. <laughs> Back down and come to the house? Yes, they have a vision prep for Israel. And again, so you got to get down? Yeah, oh, my goodness. And again, that's the situation. Like, how is this one going to do a vision prep for Israel? I'm like, it, listen, it's not easy when I'm in Israel. Because I have most radical Muslims in America. Well, that, and you if know I say that, this way, Muslims, the Palestinians will attack me. If I go that way, the Israelis will attack me. All right, that's actually a very interesting question that I could ask. You have to walk the line. Very good. I do have to walk the line. Because a lot of times, Palestinians tell me, if you're not a Palestinian, you don't know how we feel. So I'm like, you know, I'm a human being. And we all understand what's going on. And I do feel and understand how you feel. You have your peace. But my point is, how do we solve this situation without innocent lives being lost? And how do we solve this situation in a peaceful manner that things can work out properly? So I do. If I if I say something in favor of the Palestinians, the people of Israel will attack me. If I say something for Israel, the Palestinians attack me. And I have all has been having this problem. So it's a very fine line. But you know what? I try to do what God says to do and hold the people back. 
I'm going to keep your number in my Rolodex yes, so, like that, that. so that if maybe one and of you... And you must send me the link if you, if you run if it. You, yes. Um, w, I'll text you. I'll text you. I'll text so you. We can look at it. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate your time I again. I think it's fantastic. Well, I think you've got some clips at in front. This, yeah. this is going to make nice new. Yeah. This time, that's, that, it, it's fun. Yeah, I'm yeah. fine. <laughs> Everybody is only promoting you. There is no kind of Palestinian side in the right. movie. But when you promote a ceasefire, this, this I mean, these are people from... Yes, you're gonna rock the world because well, nobody's not me. Right you, <laughs> I mean, you guys made the you made the effort. 